it to look like we got it all together, but God searches the very heart. He knows your very motive. He knows your thoughts behind it. So we can make it sound good as if we are pure in heart, but he knows your heart. He knows it. And so I'm going to go down to 1 Samuel 16, 7, and this is when Samuel was sent to um, anoint the next king of Israel. And he saw one of Jesse's sons, and he said, oh, it has to be that one because he's big and strong, and he looks the part. He looked the part. But God said, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So this message today is, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? And so as we reflect on that and we think on it, I want to give you the the anatomy definition of the heart. The heart is a pump-like organ that has four chambers, and it pumps the blood circulation through the body. But if we break it down just a little bit more, the right atrium receives the blood from the body. So what's already in the blood, it brings it back in, and then it sends it through the pulmonary artery, which goes through the lungs for it to be oxygenated. And then it goes to the left atrium, which receives that oxygenated oxygenated blood, and then that goes to the left ventricle, which pushes that back through your body. So with that first pump, if it's pulling what's in your body, and it's already going to pull in what you have in you, If you search your heart and you search your mind, and we all know ourselves, if there's poison in us, it's pushing that right back through, and it's a full cycle. If there's good in us, then of course, it's going to push that through. And so as you reflect on what's in your heart, I said, okay, God, what does the heart do in the Bible? What, what, What are some things that the heart is responsible for? So in Proverbs 4.23... It says, and I'm reading in the NIV, just so everyone is aware. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So if you allow things into your heart that is not of God, that does not edify, and we got a a rule in the house. If it's something that's not going to uplift, edify, encourage, even if it's in correction, you can still do all of that in love. So what's flowing out, just make sure it's right. That's all I ask. So that's our rule in the house. Um, The second one is Matthew 12, 34 through 35. And uh, sorry, John was speaking, John the Baptist was speaking, and he said, you brood of vipers, how can you, sorry, this is Jesus, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks with the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of good stored up in him. And an evil man brings things out of evil stored up in him. And so what I love about God is even though we mess up, we make mistakes, he knows that. But it's what we do once we are aware of those mistakes. What are we doing once someone, he might send someone, once he might correct you? What are we doing? What's our response? So I have a question. And listen, if you are not saved, please do not lie in the house of the Lord. It's all right. I pray that at the end of service you heard something that will charge your heart. But I'm asking everyone who was saved, please raise your hand. Bless the Lord. So if you have confessed that you are saved, you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he died for you and rose that you might live, these are some responsibilities of those who are saved. The first one, living a life of sacrifice. And so we're going to go to Romans 12, verse 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That, it's not just, sometimes we think, you know, living in a holy manner is just what we dress like and what we look like. 
But what's the manner of your heart? Is that a holy, pleasing place to God? Is it a true, proper worship? My, my grandmother used to always say, would you kiss Jesus with them lips? That's what she would always say. Would you kiss him with the lips? So what is coming out of your mouth? Is it death or is it life? What are we speaking? What are we saying? How are we portraying who God is? If we confess that Christ is our Lord and Savior, that means we are to be walking towards Christ. Like we are to be walking towards being just like him. And I'm not saying it's an easy road, but we got to keep going and keep pushing. But in the renewing of your mind, that's where change will be able to happen. Because when the enemy has your mind, whew, he can make you talk about yourself. <laughs> he can make you think up some stories that aren't even happening. You become paranoid about this one saying this and that one saying that and this one thinks this. And some of it is mostly in our head. Unfortunately, he knows how to make, and I used to say this, the inner me is my enemy. What are we saying to ourselves? What are we doing? How are we encouraging ourselves? How are we uplifting ourselves? So that was living a life of sacrifice. The second one, if we're a child of God and saved, you ought to be a humble servant in the body of Christ. And I'm going to go to my apologies. Pastor Marshall, would you mind just going to the next one? <laughs> For the grace given me, I say everyone, sorry. My apologies, I thought I put it on here, but it's okay. Nonetheless, um, the scripture specifically speaks of, for the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Do not think, sorry. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We each belong to all the others. So we're not here to boast up of ourselves. We're not here to make ourselves be glorious in light. We're here to be of help and service to others. God has chosen each of every one of us, no matter what that role looks like, how are we edifying one another? How are we lifting one another? How are we protecting one another? Whether that's in prayer, and we're going to get to it, or even in correction, how are we loving on each other? The next one is love in action. And we know we have a ministry named after that because it is an action word. It's not just saying it. It's not just, oh, you know, it sounds good. How are we actually putting that on display? So in Romans 12, 14 through 21, it says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. And I'm sorry, I might have gone quickly, but that was Romans 12, 14 through 21. Honor one another above yourselves. So this brings us back to this image. We've come very confused in this world today that it's all about self. How do I look? What does everyone think of me? But we are to honor one another above ourselves, above ourselves. If you can help someone even when you are going through, that is honoring someone above yourself. And I'm, again, none of this is easy. And we only use the scripture, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me for, okay, for a job or for this. But that includes that too. That means that it is only with Christ that we're able to do those things. It's only with Christ that we can put someone else above us and not feel as if you have put yourself down. Lastly, I'm going to finish just reading um, this, this, this passage. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse them. It's easy to say, well, I'm justified because they made me feel this way. I'm justified because they did this to me. But God said, bless them. Sometimes that might be financially. Sometimes that might just even be a hug. 
What are we doing if God says to bless someone, not to curse them? Even when they probably stabbed you in the back a couple times, and you know they did, can we still, can we still cling to one another and put someone above ourselves? Do not repay anyone evil. This is verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friend, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become overwhelmed, overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Sometimes we want to make the person feel bad, so we will say certain things and little comments here and little comments there to try to get a person to recognize their wrongdoing. But God said, just continue in my love. Continue as I told you to continue. I don't need you to do anything. If I ask you to go to them, then go in what I say. Don't go in what you're saying because more times than not, if somebody does this wrong, real quick, our flesh is like, if they don't know how much I'm ready to just, but when we're honest with it and say, all right, God, I'm feeling a way. Go to God with it. Sometimes we go to a friend we, we, we go to other people, and if they say one thing that agrees, oh, it's over. You're like, see, I told you because this and that, and it attaches, and it causes us again to feel justified in how we're feeling. But bring that to God, and he'll tell you how to handle it. Sometimes he might say, be silent, and that's probably one of the hardest responses <laughs> is silence, and silence is a response, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> Lastly, if you're a child of God, it says we are to react in this manner. And I'm going to read it again. This is Matthew 12, 34 through 35. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And that doesn't mean that if you've made a mistake or you've slipped up that you're an evil man, but what's in your heart? That's why the question continues. What's in your heart? What's stored up in your body? What's going to circulate through? What's going to pump back through your body and ultimately come out of your mouth? Because what's here, then a thought is going to come, then you're going to say it, and then the next time it's going to be an action. And so how can we stop it from being the action, from being said, to check in what's in our heart before it even comes here. So I said, all right, God, well, what's some things that causes our heart to be clogged? (laughs) And one of the things he said was, the gifts have, have become louder than the fruit. How have we magnified our gifts to be louder than the fruit of the spirit? That's the evidence, the fruit. Many have gifts. There were many of prophets in the Bible that were with God, and then they turned. Some for money, some for glory and fame. So what is in your heart, and how have you magnified your gift over the fruit? And so I say, I said, okay, well, what, what are some of these things? Number one, offense. We've allowed somehow to think that well, if somebody says something to me that's going to correct me and turn me back towards Christ, oh, they mean me harm. Oh, they don't mean me any good because society has become so easily offended. You say one thing and it could be out of the kindness of your heart and it's taken a whole nother way, a complete different way. <laughs> so Proverbs nineteen eleven tells us a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. 
And sometimes I know we think, oh, well, if I, if I, let, her, if I let him or her get away with it, then they're going to think that they, they can do anything towards me. And do, 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 it, it, again, it's always in here we have these thoughts and stories. But at the end of the day, if our goal is for our, the fruit of the spirit to shine, then that's how you can overlook the offense. Because you know what? Even though you did me wrong, just like Christ forgave me, I'm going to forgive you. And that brings us into the next one that clogs the heart. Unforgiveness. Luke 17, verses 3 through 4. Pay attention and always be on guard. Looking out, and I'm sorry, I'm reading this in the, in the Amplified, just because there were some words added in there that I feel like makes you kind of really get the, get the word and understanding, but it is in the NIV. Pay attention and always be on guard, looking out for one another. If your brother sins and disregards God's precepts, solemnly warn him. And if he repents and changes, forgive him. Even if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. This is give up resentment and consider the offense recalled and annulled. So can we truly Continue to forgive. Continue to forgive. And so sometimes I know we think, well, I'm not going to subject myself to keep getting hurt. And da, 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 da. There are some things that you are going through on purpose because God is testing some things in you. <laughs> so we can't get away from people that do not like us. They're everywhere in the world. They're sometimes in the church, sometimes in your very own home, unfortunately. So if you can't deal with it, how are you going to deal with those who are going to challenge your very identity as a Christian? If you're having trouble identifying and forgiving your fellow brother and sister in Christ, how can you forgive the very one that might say, that's a whole lie. None of that is true. How can you continue to still love and speak to them in a manner that is gentle I know we see in the world a lot of people like to use the word as a weapon to tear people down, but that's not what the word is for. That is not what the word is for. We are to move in love. God came with love and compassion. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world. So how have we somehow become so full of ourselves to think that, oh, I'm going to make you feel bad and make you feel shame? No, that's not, the way we, that's not the way we move. That's not how we're supposed to move in correction. And that brings us to correction. And I'm specifically going to bring up Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14. And it says, take care, brothers and sisters, that not be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart, which refuses to trust and to rely on the Lord, Sorry, again, this is in the Amplified, but it is up there. I just wanted to highlight these words. Which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God, but continually encourage one another every day as long as it is called today. And there is an opportunity so that none of you will be hardened instead, set, or, or instead settled in rebellion. But by the deceitfulness of sin, it cleverly, it cleverly and, de, and de, delusively glamours and sophisticates for those we are believers and have become partakers of Christ, sharing in all that the Messiah has for us. If only we hurled firm our newborn confidence, which originally led us to him until the end. So just to break that down a little bit, it is our responsibilities as brothers and sisters in Christ to make sure that no one falls, to make sure that we're not watching a brother and sister continue down a path that we know is not leading them towards Christ. And then if they come to you, this is where offense now says, oh no, they're trying to make me look bad or trying to make me look this. But no, that's the role of each other. We are to help and encourage one another. And I'm going to bring up two examples, and I, I, don't, I didn't give the scriptures for this. I just wanted to use it as an example but I'll give you the scripture and you can read it at home. It's 2 Samuel 12, verses 7 through 14. And in this scenario, David had sinned and he, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had a husband killed to try and cover up the adultery and the baby that they were just getting ready to have. 
And Nathan the prophet came to David, and he gave him, let's say, a parable of a, of a rich man. And David was so far consumed in his sin that he didn't even recognize that he was talking about him, his very own self. And his response was, that person should be killed. <laughs> that person, this should happen, that should happen. And then Nathan said, you are the rich man. Now imagine David said, no, I'm not. Get away from me. You don't know what you're talking about. And he kept on his merry way. He would have kept on slipping and going farther and farther away from God. But what, David, what made David a man after God's own heart was even when he sinned, even when he messed up, he repented and he turned. He turned. And that doesn't mean that you're going to always make perfect decisions. No. But can we recognize when we've messed up and be humble enough to turn, to say, God, you know what? I was tripping that day. I, I, something was going on and I flew off the handle or I, I said what I wanted to say and that wasn't of you. And so God, forgive me. Can we humble ourselves? It's in humbleness where we're able to make ourselves low, not see ourselves as above correction. Everyone is going to be corrected. Every single person. So there is correction all through the house, all through the house. Secondly, and I, I like to do, you know, sometimes we feel like, okay, well, Nathan was a prophet, and so he was Holy Ghost filled and sanctified and all that good stuff. In Galatians 2, verse 12, Paul calls out Peter on his hypocrisy. <laughs> Peter was mingling with the Gentiles and eating with them and enjoying them. And then when the Jewish people and leaders came into town, he left the Gentiles and went and sat with the Jewish people as if the Gentiles didn't mean anything, as if he was above the Gentiles. And Paul called him out on it. Now, if somebody, a fellow minister came over to you and tried to correct you, let's be honest with ourselves. How would we respond? What's in our heart? What's our automatic reaction? And if we are in this I'm going to be honest. It takes you spending time in the presence of God, spending time in his word that is hidden in your heart that you might not sin against him. And that's how you keep us, we keep ourselves from lashing out. When we, we think, nope, 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 let me, let me catch myself. And we come back to who Christ says we are, who we are to be. And Peter was able to be corrected by his fellow brother and didn't take offense and he recognized it. So can we be corrected and be okay in our correction? The last thing is vengeance. In 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12, and again, Pastor Marsha, this is in the Amplified version. <laughs> Finally, all of you be like-minded, united in spirit, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, courteous, compassionate towards each other as members of one household, and humble in spirit, never return evil for evil or insult for insult, avoid scolding, berating, and any kind of abuse, but on the contrary, give a blessing, pray for one another's well-being, contentment and protection, for you have been called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing from God that brings well-being, happiness, and protection. For the one who wants to enjoy life and see good days uh, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile, treachery, and deceit. He must turn away from wickedness and do what is right. He must search for peace with God, with self, and with others, and pursue it eagerly. That means actively, not merely just desiring it. For the eyes of the Lord are looking favorably upon the righteous. The upright and the ears are attentive to their prayer, eager to answer. But the face of the Lord is against those who pr practice evil. And there's a line in there that I, I want to highlight, and I remember this in my early 20s, and I was like, God, I want to be this, and I, I want to do this, and I want to live right, and I don't want to act this way. And his response was not what I was expecting. He simply said, okay, so what are you going to do? And I was like, what you mean? I'm, I'm asking you. I, like, I need, 
what am I going to do? But what are you going to do? So if you want to live right, how do we live right? That means, you know what? I'm coming to Bible study. I'm coming to prayer. I'm going to stay in the presence of God because that's where the transformation happens. I'm going to stay in my word and in my prayer closet because that's where the transformation happens. It sounds good to say, I want to do this and I want to do that, but what are we going to do? What are we actually going to do? Are we going to make that effort and that push and fight and push past every lie and every thought that comes to your mind? Are we going to push through? Are we going to push past? And so what I love about God is he is never going to correct you and not tell you how to come out of it. So <laughs> this is the faithfulness of God. So I said, Lord, well, okay, God, well, what do, what do we have to do? And he said, so I was just thinking about all of the sermons we've had leading up to this point. And God had truly been dealing with his people, our behavior, our representation of him, and how we treat his people. Because at the end of the day, even if they're not saved, they're his. They belong to him. So that does not mean if somebody is unsaved, you get the right to just talk however you like. No, we don't. We don't get to do that. No. We're still to be the representation. So in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 15, it says, So as God's own chosen people who are holy, and again, I'm in the Amplified, sorry, I bounced between two, <laughs> who are holy, set apart, sanctified for his purpose, and well-beloved by God himself, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper, bearing graciously with one another and willingly forgiving each other if one has cause for complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you forgive. Beyond all these things, put on and wrap yourselves in unselfish love which is the perfect bond of unity. For everything is bound together in agreement when each one seeks the best for others. So as we think about this and we let this resonate in our hearts and we reflect on ourselves, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I've always been the nicest person. No. Prior to Christ, I was real nasty and mean. I can tell you right now. I knew how to cut you down to size with some words and... I didn't care anything about it. I moved how I wanted to move, and I didn't think anything about Christ. I wasn't. But I thank God that when he came into my life and I called out to him because I just recognized I was going down a road that was only going to lead to my death, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to harm myself anymore. I don't want to stab at myself and make wounds and bruises on my own body and you died for me and took the bruises. I didn't want to do it anymore. So he said, get back to basics. The first one is examine and reflect on ourselves. And I know we, we had community today, but examining ourselves is not just on first Sunday. Every single day, examine yourself. <laughs> Take a look at yourself. What am I saying? How am I acting? Am I portraying? Am I living out the fruit of the spirit? Am I moving in kindness? Am I moving in humility? Am I moving in gentleness? Am I moving in patience? Am I moving in self-control? Am I moving in the things of God? Am I moving in peace and love? How am I moving? How am I talking? How am I interacting with people? That was number one. And sec so that in 2 Corinthians 13.5, it says, test and evaluate yourself to see, Pastor Marsh, you don't have this, so don't worry. <laughs> test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, not me, not the person next to you, yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as a counterfeit. Do, un, uh, uh, 
I don't want to be a counterfeit. <laughs> I don't want to be a pretender. I don't want to be a hypocrite. That is the one thing that I, I, I'm like, God, I want to make sure I'm representing you right. I don't want anyone to ever say, well, I saw you doing this, and not that they should, but am I your representation on my job? Am I your representation in my home? Because sometimes we are five different people depending upon where we are. So once again, what's in our heart? Because what's in your heart is what will continue to circulate. The next thing he said was, do unto others as we would like them to do unto you. And the world says that that's the golden rule, but that comes from the Bible. <laughs> that is Luke 6, 31. Do unto others as we would like them to do unto us. The next thing he said was use the fruit as your metric. Galatians, again, back at the top where we just did, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are your metrics we can stand and look at and say, okay, what I just said, did it reflect any of those? And if it didn't, back to number one, examine yourself. If you have to repent, repent. If you have to apologize, apologize. <laughs> we sometimes think we're above apologizing to people. <laughs> no, no, no. You must go and apologize because if somebody wronged you, you will want them to apologize to you. Sometimes you might not get it. So I'm not saying to be stuck in that place that if they don't apologize to you, then you have to, oh, well, I'm going to match what they're doing because the word already told us don't repay evil with evil. So again, we're going to use the word because that is our weapon. It is also our correction. And lastly, remember, you said you were saved. You said you accepted Christ. So when you accept Christ, you get a new name. You are redeemed, <laughs> you are loved, you are made free. So your old name is not who you are. I know a lot of people like to say, well, that's just who I am. Or is it? So did you change? Did something happen when you said, Lord, I want to be yours? Did something happen? You get a new story. And, 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 and um, Brendan read it earlier, Jeremiah 29, 11. He said, I have a plan. So you get a new story and a new future, <laughs> a future that is in hope, a future that is in goodness and health, a future that is before you. And when I say goodness and health, don't always think that that means you won't have any afflictions. Goodness and health is not just what your physical body is experiencing. What's your spirit man doing? That's goodness and health. <laughs> that is goodness and health. How is our spirit man being the reflection? And lastly, you get a new nature. So the old tongue, <laughs> the, the old ways, that is not the way. You are a new creature, a new creature. You no longer have to resort to the responses that we used to have because when we accept Christ and we allow him to do a work in us, he only does good things. There is no thing he will do that will be bad, nothing. Everything he made was good. He looked and said it was very good. So we are a very good work. Walk in that identity. Walk with that as your weapon and your shield. That any time, even a thought, whether it's from a person you know or someone you don't know, we have to move in love. We have to move in love. And this is the benefit. And I'm going to end here. The benefits of unity in the body of Christ is Psalms 133, verses 1 through 3. Behold how good and pleasant is it for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil of consecration, poured on the head, coming down on the beard, even the beard of Aaron, coming down upon the edge of his priestly robes, consecrating the whole body. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon and coming down on the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. When we operate in unity, when we operate in likeness and in like spirit, if we're all Christians, if we're all believers of Christ, if we're all saved and redeemed by his blood, when we operate in that, he commands a blessing. 
there has to be a blessing. <laughs> like, there has to be a blessing of life forevermore. And that doesn't mean a life filled with resentment or bitterness or anger. Because the moment you give the enemy just the tiniest slither, he adds all the rest of his little friends. And they come in like gangbusters. And now it's a little bit harder to push those things away. And so again, I want us all to examine ourselves. If we've made a mistake, recognize it. Humble yourself and repent. Don't believe you're above correction because everyone is going to be corrected. God said he chastens after those whom he loves. That just means he's going to come. He's going, okay, all right, I see. You know, you tried. You made a mistake. But I'm going to keep on cleaning you up. He also said he prunes. When you prune, you cut. It's a cut. It hurts sometimes. It's going to cause some tears. It hurts. So are we okay with letting God prune us? And that does not always mean it's going to only come from him. It might be someone here on earth that he sends to you. Have you rejected the very person that he sent to you to cause you to open your eyes? So I say again, what's in your heart? God bless you.